Solving General Chemistry Problems Thermodynamics For several centuries, engineers and scientists struggled to develop engines wherein heat from burning wood or coal could be harnessed to perform some useful work. A very small fraction of the overall energy, small as 2%, was converted into work. Where did the other energy go? Was there a limit to how much better it could get? Would there always be wasted energy? In wrestling with this challenge, the concept of entropy was refined and named by Rudolf Clausius in 1854. He developed the mathematical expression and recognized that this property behaved as a state function. This concept developed into the second law of thermodynamics and was widely hailed as a major theoretical achievement. In about 1875, Ludwig Boltzmann gave a new interpretation of entropy based on a statistical analysis and provided a new equation to characterize entropy. Perhaps surprisingly, scientists for decades and longer recognized the theoretical usefulness of the concept, but also appreciated how hard it was to understand at what it actually was. One story is told of a scientist extending these ideas into the field of communication. His name was Claude Shannon, and was encouraged by von Neumann to call the information loss entropy, because since, quote, no one understands what entropy is, in a debate you will always have the advantage, end of quote. It turns out that this energy loss and Shannon's information loss have the identical foundation. They both really are entropy. So we should not be discouraged if we find the concept hard to understand. The greatest minds have wrestled with it for many decades, but it is a central concept in modern thermodynamics, energy production, flow and use, and in the modern world we are affected by it continually. So we need to work with it and we need to struggle to understand it. Entropy is sometimes taught from a probability perspective, like using dice or coin tosses. Sometimes it is taught from a perspective of disorder and randomness. Students are often confused by how these ideas translate into chemistry. So let's try something different. Let's try an approach that will focus on energy distribution or dispersal. Now you might think of the change of enthalpy in a reaction as the production or consumption of energy. The first law, for instance, tells us that the change in internal energy is equal to the flow of energy in the form of heat and work. By contrast, you can think of the change in entropy as describing the change in the way energy can be stored or the way that energy is dispersed among the many ways a molecular system can store energy. Think of it as the amount of energy that a system has to store in order to exist at that temperature. The amount of energy needed to allow the system to populate all of the various degrees of freedom, translation, which is its motion through space, rotation, vibration, electronic, all the motion for which it must have sufficient energy in order to be at this temperature. The ways in which a particular molecular system develops these various motions is different from every other molecular system and is the reason each system has a unique amount of entropy at any given temperature. Let me use the following model to explain some of these ideas. Now remember, it turns out that this concept is hard to grasp and difficult to appreciate its application to chemistry, so don't be overwhelmed if you are puzzled at first. And remember, this is just one approach to explaining these ideas. Look at some others and see if you can become more comfortable with the concept. Now this is an art installation by Joanne Tinker that's entitled Goblets. The goblets are all made from foil wrappers, hence the recycled art idea. But just think of a wall of goblets. That's all that's important here. Imagine now that you have a large barrel of water and are assigned the task of filling the goblets with water. Now, I've got no idea why anyone would want to fill a wall of goblets with water, but you know, I guess there's no accounting for taste. So you have a pitcher with which to dip out the water and you go along filling goblets until you run out of water. To make the picture easier to visualize, I will simplify it. Here are four shelves with six empty glasses, which are represented by the unfilled circles on each shelf. You start filling the goblets at the bottom and continue till you run out of water. In this case, imagine you had enough water to fill nine goblets. Here's what it might look like. In this model, the amount of water you have to distribute amongst the glasses is like the enthalpy or internal energy. The goblets represent the different modes of motion or degrees of freedom of the molecular system. The level of the shelf represents the energy of the goblets that sit on it. The energy, the, the higher the shelf, the more energy involved. Another way to envision this would be to imagine that the goblets increased in size as they were placed on a higher shelf. Now the shelf level, where we run out of water, represents the temperature of the system. 
Now imagine a different wall with the shelves and goblets arranged differently. Larger goblets are still on higher shelves. We have the same amount of water to distribute, but because there are fewer goblets on the lower shelves, we have to go to higher shelves to transfer all of the water. Note also that since we must fill more goblets at higher energy, we are only able to fill eight goblets this time before running out of water. But notice how we run out. When we run out, our last goblets are higher up on the wall. We conclude that this system with the same amount of enthalpy, enthalpy is nevertheless at a higher temperature. Consider now a slightly different view of our walls. Rather than have them absorb the same amount of enthalpy, let's instead ensure that they are at the same temperature. Imagine that they come into contact with each other, and the one with more energy loses some of that energy to the one with less energy. We do this by taking water from the highest goblets and let it fill the lowest empty ones. The final picture might look something like this. Here the two walls are now at the same temperature, but the amount of water, enthalpy or energy, absorbed by the one is greater than that of the other wall. Perhaps you can see the origin of the property of heat capacity in this model. Now this is not quite the whole story. It turns out that we are not nearly so orderly when filling the goblets. It is easier to be sure to fill the lowest ones first, but every now and then we might get energetic, uh, pun intended, and crawl higher up the ladder and fill a higher up goblet. Or we might fill up some goblet that is on the same shelf rather than ones that we fill now. Yes, it takes more water to fill the higher up goblets, but we always fill up until we run out of water. But start to imagine the various ways we might fill up the goblets when we allow ourselves to fill them up in any and all ways possible. The only restriction is that, as always, when people are involved, we are fundamentally lazy. To fill the higher up goblets means we have to climb a ladder higher, and we just don't do that very often. Molecularly, this means that while we can place energy in a higher level shelf, we are less likely to do so. So start to imagine all of the ways we might fill the goblets, while bearing in mind our predilection to fill the lower ones more often, but not exclusively. The number of ways becomes very large, and there is a kind of average distribution that starts to emerge as the most common way to fill the goblets. Entropy is not just the filling of the goblets, but it is the many different ways we can fill the goblets. This is where the statistical perspective on entropy comes in. When a given system has more ways to store energy than another, we characterize that as the system having more entropy than the other. The number of energy levels, the various ways to occupy them, the energy level each requires, the probability of occupying higher levels, all this works together to create an entropy for a particular system. As the amount of energy available increases, new levels become accessible and the entropy increases. The way the entropy increases with increasing temperature, or energy, is unique for every molecular system. And when a chemical reaction occurs, the entropy of the reactants evolves into the entropy of the products, which may be an increase or a decrease in entropy. But the energy that is used to occupy the molecular energy levels, the energy that is used to just allow that stuff to exist at this temperature, that energy is no longer available to do work. This is the lost energy that bedeviled early engineers and inventors as they tried to advance the industrial revolution of the 17th to 19th century. We might think then that the task before us is to count the various ways to store energy and equate this with the entropy. Counting seems simple enough. Mr. Flintstone can sort of do it. Even the bard has taken a crack at it. However, a bit of a problem arises. The number of ways becomes much more than gargantuan. For just a mole of gas, the number of possible states can be something like 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 23rd power, which is 10 to the 1000023 zero, 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 zeros, or 10 raised to a very big number. These numbers are impossible to envision. For comparison, the number of atoms that make up the whole Earth is around 10 to the 49. The number of atoms that makes up the visible universe is about 10 to the 80th. We cannot count these numbers. It does help to work in logarithms, but even then. But Clausius and a host of scientists since then have been able to relate this lost energy, or perhaps we can say energy that is otherwise busy and not available to do work, can be measured. And then from this energy measurement, we can calculate an entropy. Count them? Not a chance. 
work with entropy anyway? Absolutely. Measure heat flow and temperature, and we can calculate entropy. As an aside, the discipline known as statistical thermodynamics has been developed to provide the mathematical tools for implementing this counting approach in a manageable fashion. But this is beyond the scope of general chemistry.